Welcome to our series, Save the Date Before It's Too Late. We are, we're, we're talking about relationships because we're designed for a relationship. We're designed to experience the blessing of relationship. And I thought as we started today, I thought it'd be great to learn from some kids. Let's see what kids have to say about marriage. And I think we can, maybe we'll, maybe we'll learn a little something. Here is, um, so here's a question some kids were asked. How do you decide who to marry? And here's from Alan, age 10, his answer. How do you decide who to marry? You got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should like that. You like sport and she should keep the chips and dip coming. I like Alan. Here's Chris, Kristen's answer. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> all right, next question for the kids. How can a stranger tell if two people are married? Here's Derek's response. He's eight. You might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Another question. Here we go. What do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori, age eight, said both don't want any more kids. <laughs> what do most people do on a date? All right, here we go. This is Martin. On the first date, they just tell each other lies, and that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. I don't know where he learned that, but I'm telling you what, Martin's got it going on right there. <laughs> Is it better to be single or married? Here's Anita's response. It's better for girls to be single, but not for boys. Boys need someone to clean up after them. And every wife said amen to that, right? All right, here. How would you make a marriage work, right? Here we go, Ricky. Tell your wife she looks pretty even if she looks like a dump truck. <laughs> I saved the best for last. That was last one for us today. <laughs> I want to talk about this subject today. Marital bliss or abyss? Marital bliss or abyss? I want to remind us that marriage is God's idea. The first time God said creation was not good was when he looked at man and said it's not good that man is alone. Then God blessed them both and performed the first wedding ceremony and marital bliss was enjoyed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Or was it, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it was, the, in, the scriptures don't indicate anything different. So if God has called you to be married, then God has marital bliss in mind for you. He does not have marital just struggle and pain and depression for you. It, it, it's God's idea for us to have a blessed marriage. And I want, I've been just stuck on Genesis chapter two this entire few weeks. And so I wanna go back to it and learn from it again today, the very first marriage. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And that's why guys gotta take naps even to this day. It's the Lord's work on our life. And he, <laughs> got a, <laughs> and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife we're not ashamed. So my question is, is marital bliss possible? That's the question. Well, let me look at this last verse again. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Obviously, there was some sort of marital bliss going on with this last statement about the first wedding ceremony. It's, there's something about that statement, not just, you know, that they were naked and every guy was like, that's the way it should be. It's not just that. It's that... <laughs> The scripture's trying to tell us things were good. Things were good. They had no shame. They weren't hiding anything from one another. And life was good in the Garden of Eden. So I just want to say that this is possible. Marital bliss is possible. Or if you're not married, how about just great friendships? Relational happiness is possible. Remember that the creation of marriage 
is to solve a it's not good problem. Marriage is a solution to when God said it's not good. So in other words, marriage is supposed to be good. It's supposed relationships, intimate relationships are supposed to be a blessing. That's why the scriptures say things like this in Proverbs 31. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. And look what she does for him. Good and not evil all the days of her life. So this is a scripture telling us that, listen, that relational happiness is a possibility. And I want you to notice that, so if God has designed relationships, particularly the marriage relationship, to be a blessing, there to be marital bliss, then why isn't it a lot of times? Here's why. I want you to notice the very next verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter three. The very next verse, the devil shows up on the scene. Right after God creates marriage, soon as he just blesses Adam and Eve, and he's like, whoa, woman, and they're both naked and unashamed, and in life as well in the Garden of Eden. Next verse. Now the serpent... That's when the devil showed up. Notice that the devil did not show up when Adam was all by himself. The devil didn't show up when T-Rex and dinosaurs were out and about. He didn't show up then. For some reason, the devil wasn't concerned about the stars, the moon, the sun, all the animals, none of that, or even man all by himself. But once the marriage shows up, that kind of intimate relationship the devil shows up on the scene. So the reason why it's not always bliss and it's abyss is because marital bliss is under attack. It's under attack. So whether it be your marriage, whether it be your best friends for life, godly relationships are a threat to the devil. Especially marriage. So he goes after it. It's almost as if he's just not interested in anything else until that kind of covenant shows up on the scene when intimate relationships show up on the scene. So devil uses culture. If you're paying attention at all in what the enemy does through culture, you can see that there is a strategic and systematic attack against the nuclear family. The devil wants to redefine who gets married or getting married at all, would rather people not get married, and if they do, they not be how God designed the original marriage uh, to be between a man and a woman. And so it's been under attack and will continue to be under attack because it's a threat to the enemy. And I'm here to tell you right now, your, your, your godly friendships, hear this now, they're under attack too because they're a threat to the enemy. So the, the, the entire attack of the enemy was, was kind of centered around this thought. The serpent shows up and makes Eve feel like she's missing out. Like you just, it's not good enough what you have. What you have is not all that you need. God is holding out on you. That's how he showed up first. And I'm here to tell you, it's how he shows up to bring marital bliss to abyss and godly relationships and try to destroy them is he does it through something called comparison. Where he makes you feel like, you know what, mine isn't as good as theirs. So I want to talk about how can we learn to be content in our godly relationships, particularly our marriage, without settling. Y'all here today? All right, I want to tell you a few thoughts about comparison. I'm going to show you what I believe the first marriage teaches us out of Genesis chapter 2 on how we can live in a, a, a blessing over our marriages. But the first thing I want you to see is this, is that comparison leads to frustration. Comparison leads to frustration. You're not, you're not frustrated. Everything's good in paradise until you begin to think that they've got it better than you do. Now, if you've ever wondered, where does all the fighting come from in my life? Well, I got an answer for you out of scripture, James chapter four. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? And I thought about not putting the rest of the scripture at first because the answer would, for many of us would be, well, it comes from him, right? Or it comes from her. Well, don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Here's the answer. You want what you don't have. 
So you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Wow, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So it's this preoccupation with what other people's marriages on social media, the fake ones in Hollywood, it's those ones that the enemy uses to compare to ours and we go, well, he doesn't ever buy me flowers as much as they do. And then, you know, if you would buy me flowers, then I might dress like you want me. And, you know, and everyone's like comparing and saying, yeah, but if you wore that and then if you did this, and it's like, where did that idea come from? Because some serpent showed up on the scene and said, look at them and look at what they have. There's a story of a, I read years ago of a, of a carjacking that was foiled in, northern, in a Northern Virginia shopping mall. So an elderly grandmother was given a gun by, to her, by her son just for protection. And so he had taught her how to use it and she'd come out of the mall and she was go, got up to her, uh, the car and she saw four men in the car and she dropped her bags and she pulled out her gun and she started pointing it at them and yelling and saying, listen, I, I've got a gun and I know how to use it. You get out of my car. And they just frantically just busted out of the car. And so they run off and she's feeling pretty good about herself. Like she protected herself and she opened up the back of the car and she put her groceries in the back of the car and sat down. The only problem was her key didn't fit in the ignition. <laughs> and then she realized that her car was four or five spaces down. And so she got in her car and drove down to the police station, station and, and was explaining the situation to the sergeant and the sergeant just couldn't hold back a smile and started laughing because he said, I just pointed over here to these four men who were petrified, scared about some crazy old woman who pulled a gun on them. When she took what wasn't hers, everyone missed out on enjoying what was already theirs. When we get preoccupied with trying to get something from somebody else, we, we don't even enjoy what God's already given us. So comparison leads to frustration. And I just need to tell somebody this today. Some of your frustration in your relationships right now is simply because you are comparing it to somebody else's. Rather than just enjoying what you have. Can I hear an amen today? Right? Grass ain't greener on the other side. I'm just telling you, it's astroturf. Comparison leads to frustration. It can also do this. Comparison can lead to financial ruin. And we begin to look at other people's marriages and you go, man, they've only been married five years and they've already bought a house together. And we can't even buy a car that won't get out of town without breaking down. Right? And you're like, well, they got the minivan. And some of you are like, I ain't ever getting a minivan. God bless that. Whatever. You're like, you're like, well, at least I want something right like that. And, and so you begin to compare and it can lead to financial ruin. Ruin when we combine the philosophy that that things will bring you happiness, kind of this this philosophy of humankind and in our society and in our society that easy access to credit cards. You combine that together, you you have a perfect cocktail for the devast devastation of the family unit, family budget. So someone once said that credit cards let you start at the bottom and then dig yourself a hole. <laughs> Most of you got a credit card off of this week, right? The, I think the average person gets about 32 credit card offers a year. Now, the, the average American has about $7,000 in credit card debt right now. And if you jump into the whole minimum payment plan scheme and you're, you, you got a balance of, of let's say, only $3,900, you're gonna, and you pay just the minimum payment of like 3%, you're gonna have 42 years of paying off that and pay 14, over $14,000 in that payment. So it's a perfect cocktail for financial frustration. And by the way, what do you think is one of the most favorite pastimes of teenage girls today? Shopping is one of their favorite pastimes. Dating is a distant second. One father said that if my girls don't go to the mall for three days, the mall sends them a get well card. So the unhealthy drive for more devastates finances and in doing so actually devastates families. So the, the number one factor that contributes 
to the disintegration of the family unit, of a marriage, is financial discord or, or debt. And by the way, it's not the poor that get divorced more often, it's the wealthy. Because it's something about the, this, the, the financial frustration, all right? So let's talk about then what the Bible says. How do I steer clear of all the serpent's comparison, trying to convince me that I'm missing out, that there's more, if God, just, if God just knows that if you did this, you ate of that, that you'd be better off. What do I learn from that first marriage and what God taught us in Genesis chapter two to be able to experience marital bliss? Here it is, number one is this, prioritize your relationship. Prioritize it, and here's why I say that, because this is what the Bible says. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is a scripture saying, the marriage now becomes the priority relationship in your life. You leave what used to be the priority. You leave the priority, you leave the parental oversight, and now you cling, you cleave, you join to your wife, and you become one flesh. Any relationship, hear this now, whether it be the marriage relationship or your godly friendships, any relationship that is going to experience God's blessing on it must be prioritized. You got to learn to prioritize it. So the marriage relationship comes before your relationship with your parents, your marriage relationship comes before your relationship with your children. Early on, my wife and I were uh, introduced to this particular curriculum about raising your kids, and we still have it today over in our kids' department on display over there as well for people that are raising kids. How do I raise kids God's way? And we were introduced to this concept and taking this course, and we were learning about the priority of our relationship above any other relationship. And it was one of the things probably that stood, stood, stood out to me the most out of it. And so we had something called couch time. So when I would come home, the very first thing that we were taught was, listen, instead of just having all the fun with the kids first, the best thing for the kids is to see that you prioritize your relationship. So you have something called couch time, mom and dad time first. And you, you know, the kids might at first kind of put up a fit and say, ah, I miss, miss dad all day. Or maybe it's, you know, both of you are working and they miss both of you. The first thing that brings stability to kids is, to, is the stability of the marriage. And so they see that the parents are prioritizing their relationship and it actually brings a, a, a security to the children. So we started instituting couch time. In fact, the teaching would even go on and said something about during Christmas time that when it came to Christmas time, that the parents should open their gifts to one another first before the kids. So that the kids would see the priority of the relationship of marriage. And it brings again that stability that kids need knowing that mom and dad are healthy and they prioritize one another. So the priority of the relationship, this is the beginning and the foundation of having God bless your relationship is we learn to prioritize it. In fact, Paul in the New Testament even speaks about how much the priority affects how we even serve the Lord. Look at this out of 1 Corinthians chapter seven. He goes, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man, look at this, has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. My wife is just clapping her little hands raw today. So, so this single apostle is talking to some people before they're married. He's like, hey, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. You know, an unmarried man can do like me and you can just serve the Lord everywhere. But if you're gonna get married, I need you to know this, it becomes a priority. It becomes a priority. And you have to think about your earthly responsibilities and how to, and it goes on, by the way, and it does speak about a wife, how to please her husband. Dude, come on now, men come on, dude. All right, here we go. <laughs> so here's what this means. Here's what it means. Can I get real practical? Hurry home. Hurry home. 
And I understand that there's times you can't hurry home. You got to work late and things got to do. But what I'm saying is, is in your heart, in your spirit, you're like, I want to get home. I want to get home. You're texting. You're saying, man, I'm running late. Man, I want to be with you. You know, it's like you've got something in you that it is obvious you have prioritized your relationship. So you're texting throughout the day. Like one of the things we do as well is that we will prioritize a day of the week. And we say, okay, we're going to have a date day. We're going to have a date night. We're going we're gonna to get out of town often. We drive to Tri-City and go, any Costco shoppers here? And I know that's like a date for us. We're like, I'm going to Costco. So hanging out together and having a day that you know, this is our family day. This is our day. Because if you don't schedule it, it doesn't, I'm here to tell you, it, it won't become a priority. You say, well, it's a priority in my heart. Let me see it on your calendar. It's got it. So same thing with your relationships, right? It's like you got to prioritize your friendships and say, you know, what? how often am I getting together with my godly friends? Am I showing up to the life group? Am I having opportunities that I'm missing because I, I just, you know, I'm just too busy. The devil will make sure you're too busy because he's threatened by godly relationships. Okay. So here's my question. Is your spouse getting the best of you? So uh, you're, you're not married to your job. All right, let's flip it. You're not married to your kids. The priority of our heart, once we choose to get married, it's like, if I want it to be blessed, then I got to prioritize that relationship. Can I hear a whisper amen today? <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Now, next thing happens in this whole Garden of Eden. You got Adam and Eve, and they're naked and unashamed, and everything is good. And then serpent shows up. Eve's deceived, gives a bite of the forbidden fruit to her husband, and the entire planet and cosmos is affected. The fall of man happens. How many of you know this was not like a, just a minor mistake? This wasn't like, hey, I forgot to pay the bill on time, the water bill. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll pay the interest and we'll figure it out. No, 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 no. Um, we got kicked out. Uh, we got evicted from the Garden of Eden. Forever. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we can't ever go back. Uh, there's like flaming swords and guards. Make sure that we never go back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, work's going to be a whole lot harder. Childbirth, woo, going to be painful. And uh, we're going to eventually die. Yeah, we, weren't, we were never going to die. We we're going to live forever. And um, yeah, things went bad to worse. Horrible day. So well, how are we going to have marital bliss now? How are we going to have marital bliss? I promise you that there were some conversations about why did you eat that forbidden fruit? Man, I miss Maui. Right? And I mean, you know they had a lot of them. So how do you live in marital bliss now? You forgive forever. You just forgive forever. Because the moment I choose not to forgive is the moment a wall comes between us. Because there will all, anybody that you're close to, any of your closest friends, if you're gonna stay friends long term, everybody is gonna have to forgive everybody forever. They're gonna be somewhere along the line, you gonna offend me, I'm gonna offend you. Sometimes we aren't even gonna know that we're offending one another. It's like I did, I had no idea. Yeah, but that's why I hate you now. <laughs> so they had a lot of conversations and they had, you know, they did. And they just had to 500 years later go like, well, I still forgive you. I have to still forgive you. We're just going to destroy what we got here. I can't, I can't let bitterness win out. I just can't go there. You know, there was, there was a, there was a couple of, um, a couple of ladies that were fighting in a church in Philippi. And it was obviously such a big deal that Paul the Apostle hears about it. And he writes to the church scripture. And forever in the scripture, we get to see how these two ladies didn't get along. 
And this is what he says. He goes, I appeal to Udia and Syntyche. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. <laughs> Think of that. We're going to meet them someday in heaven, right? We're like, what were you guys fighting about? <laughs> that it made it in the Bible, right? <laughs> I mean, get over it already. How do you do that? Because you belong to the Lord. You don't belong to yourself. You ain't in charge of you. You belong to God. Now, you're not getting along with another sister is a mark against the gospel. So figure it out. Somebody's going to have to forgive. So settle your disagreement. All right, we're still learning from Adam and Eve. I'm gonna give you two more thoughts. Celebrate the uniqueness of each other. Rather than, you are such a, you are so, you are such a, and celebrate it. You are so strong. <laughs> Smelling. <laughs> Can we go to school together just for... <laughs> Genesis 2. Let, let's go back to this chapter 2. Okay, ready? The Lord God said it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. By the way, if you want to ever study a Hebrew word, this would be a great one. I'm not going to go into it, but helper comparable is a phenomenal Hebrew word study, so you learn this is not like servant. This is often, most often in the Old Testament, speaks of the Lord is my helper. Like when I need help, I go, it's the same word. It speaks of God as my helper. It's a great word to study out. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs, also a very important interesting word to study out. It's most often translated side, like the side of the tabernacle. Um, he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, Hebrew word, Isha, I-S-H-A-H. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of Ish, I-S-H. Everything I read so far that said man actually is not the same word that is for the first time used in the Hebrew text for man here. The word that is translated man, man earlier up to this point is the word pretty much for Adam, which is just saying human being. It's neutral. It's not the uniqueness yet. But it's when Isha is taken from the side of Ish, it's then the very first time that the Hebrew word for man shows up in the Bible. Showing us the uniqueness. The uniqueness of woman and the uniqueness of man and that both are made in the image of God and together they reflect the glory of the Lord. Any cultural wars that attempt to divide or, or, or to cut down man or woman are nothing other than the serpent trying to destroy the very image-bearing man and woman nature that rests within him. So the, the point of Isha and Ish, the woman and man, is that they are unique. They're different yet the same. They're, they're both of the same value, but they are unique. And if you have been married or been close relationship with someone of the opposite sex, you begin to know how different we are. 
My wife is far more of a discerner and a feeler than I am. I'm more of a logical and sometimes too quick of a decision maker than she is. I might look at something and just use my mind or the financial decision. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And just go, yeah, that's not going to work in the back of my mind because it costs too much. <laughs> and so at other times, so what we have learned is to learn to lean in to each other's uniqueness. So at times, I will, I will slow down or I will not do something when I hear her perspective of what she discerns or what she feels. And other times, she will lean in and she will not do something because she hears what my logical or my thought pattern is about that decision. And we've learned to celebrate the uniqueness of one another rather than you're a boat anchor. Well, you're a wild man. Right? Instead of like, like degrading each other's uniqueness to learn to, you, to, to lean in to one another's uniqueness. Is there anybody in the room today? So if I'm gonna have a blessed marriage or if you're gonna have blessed godly relationships rather than dislike the uniqueness, celebrate the uniqueness. When we learn to, to lean in and to celebrate each other's uniqueness, we see the blessing of God because God says this, he, wherever there's unity, he commands a blessing. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta stop. So come up and start playing something soft and nice. <laughs> Look at this. Mark says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Proverbs says, homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. They're built on both. So celebrate the uniqueness in one another. And last but not least thought about how do I really experience marital bliss is just I learned to trust God. Because this, this is what Jesus said about that scripture. They're no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. He's quoting that passage. He's like, God's the one who's done this. So he's the creator of it. He's the one who brings you together in godly relationships. Trust him. Trust him. Don't let man separate you from your divine connections in life. The very same chapter, Matthew chapter 19, a few verses later, Jesus says this. He says, Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I don't know where you are today. Whether you're bitter, angry, hurt, offended, lonely. With men, it might be impossible. But with God, everything's possible. He can restore our hearts. He can heal. He can reconcile. He can do things that man could never do. And so I wanna pray for us today, the blessing of God upon our relationships and that we will recognize every time the serpent tries to show up and to sow seeds of comparison or frustration or deception to separate us from the godly relationships that God has designed for us in our life. Will you stand up so I can pray for you today? Jesus, today I thank you that you were the one who said, what well, God has joined, to let man separate it. And you're the one who said, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Father, I pray a release of wisdom and understanding and grace and forgiveness, peace, the ministry of reconciliation, I pray for the, the truth of your word to prevail because for the Lord's sake, we choose to settle our disagreements. For the Lord's sake, we belong to you. And we ask, oh God, that you would come in the midst 
of all of our relationships. I pray for those who are married online and in the room. I pray for every marriage. I pray, God, that you would bless it. I pray that it become a priority. I pray, God, for the blessing of the Lord. And I pray that you would reveal the married couples. This is where I've been letting the, the serpent in. This is where I've been allowed him to deceive me. And no longer am I going to allow that. And I pray for all the godly relationships and the best friends that people are developing even in this moment. And over the life groups and the divine connections that you have for us in our life. And I pray the wisdom of God. I pray, I pray the word of God to lead our, our lives. Lead us, oh God. And I pray that you would command your blessing because there's such a unity in our spirit and such a unity over our life. I pray all of this in your matchless name, Jesus. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this room and you are not sure if you're born again, that's what Jesus said you must be. If you're not sure you have a relationship with Jesus, I'm praying one more prayer today. Do not miss this opportunity to get your life right with God. If you know your life is not right with Jesus, do not wait another moment. I pray for my friends today. And I ask Jesus, will you forgive me? I pray on their behalf, forgive me. I'm done doing things my own way. I don't want to li live my life apart from you anymore. Become my Lord and be my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I'll live my entire days out with you as my Lord and my Savior for the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen. 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 Can we give God a hand clap today? <laughs>